Good morning and thank you so much for joining me today. I've got a very hot topic to discuss with you this morning. It's talking about finding godly peace during this craziness that surrounds us. So to begin with, maybe a, an image will help us enter into it. It's about an art student who was asked to paint for an exam an oil painting of peace. Now, if you had to paint a painting, painting of peace, or I had to, you pretty much know what it's going to be about. And the professor left the student to this, but after a while decided to check in with the student, who should be pretty much close to the end by now. And the professor was quite shocked by what he saw. I mean, right now you've got your image of peace in your mind, I've got my image of peace in my mind. But this painting was largely about war, death, the stormy weather, you know, there's dark clouds and lightning and tornadoes and fierce winds and poverty. But in the middle was a tree, and on one of its branches was a little bird, happy little bird, colorful one, and it was happily singing. And understandably, this professor was confused, and he asked the student to explain. And the student explained that the bird was at peace in his surroundings, despite the chaos around his surroundings. So there's a reality. It's a twofold reality. Peace in Christ is possible despite the craziness around us. And the other reality is the world in which we live is not at peace with itself. So yes, we can be like the little bird, peacefully singing God's praises despite the craziness that is all around us. So let's turn to scripture. It's going to be a couple of them that I'm going to read from the New International Version, and we'll get to them as we work through. But for now, it's important to get a, an image of what the Bible is saying about godly peace. The first one is Luke 2, verse 14. It reads, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace... I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Philippians 4 verse 17, very well known. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And then at Christmas time, we quite often use this passage from Isaiah 9, verse 6 to 7, very, very well known. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So briefly, from Luke 2, we learn that peace is promised to those who God favors. Not everybody, to those who God favors. There's a specific context. From John 14, we learn that Jesus' peace is for believers. And this is again confirmed in Philippians 4. From Isaiah, we learn that Jesus will one day return and peace will be widespread and everlasting. He has come. He has established peace in our hearts. We got that from John 16 verse 33, but he's coming again. So also from John 16 verse 33, we learn that Jesus' peace is a present reality in the lives of believers. Despite the consequences and troubles and tribulation and the hardships of living in a hostile world. So right now we can say to each other that, Biblical peace differs from peace in the world. In the world, peace can refer to the absence of conflict. In other words, there's a subtraction. But biblical peace refers to the presence of Jesus, despite what is happening in our lives and in the world. Therefore, biblical peace 
it, it adds, you know, it adds, it's, it's a despite. It enriches, it comforts, it empowers. And indeed, the Hebrew word for peace, shalom, you've heard that word many times. It means like a calmness, peace, harmony, wholeness, completeness, prosperity. It's going well with me and tranquility of individuals and groups. And I don't see how this shalom type of peace can be realized without God's enabling. So where does this leave us today, sitting, facing each other in a conversation, to find and experience godly peace? And there's three aspects we need to touch on. The first one is peace with God. And this is a sovereign work of God because He first chose you. He first loved you. He's the one accepting you. He gave us life for you. And we need to clearly understand this because if it was me choosing Him, me accepting Him, me loving Him and me giving His life for Him, I would have it the wrong way around. I need God and He reconciled me to Him. There's nothing in me or about me. There's nothing I can do to cause God to accept, love, and choose me. I'm the one with sin. He is the holy and sinless one. And it is He who chose us. So peace comes with God forgiving me. Him paying the consequences of my sin through Jesus Christ's work on the cross. This is a gift. It is His mercy, His grace, His love, all in action. I can't earn it. But I can believe, confess, and accept that he did it. Another aspect of peace with God is when we follow him and we live his will for our lives. You may find along this journey of progressive sanctifications that there are things that the Holy Spirit is bringing to mind, things that need to be done differently or things that need to happen. The point I'm making here is that peace follows obedience. And we've also got to turn to peace with others because let's be honest with one another. We can walk into a bookstore and we just see these many how-to books and um, how to live in harmonious relationships and get on with others. And you've got the idea. But the fact that there's so many of these books speaks to a reality. It speaks to a need and, and with good reason. Because anger, jealousy, bitterness and so forth, all these things that don't really belong, when they are not resolved and when they are inappropriately expressed, they are destructive forces within individuals and within communities. Listen to what Hebrews 12 verse 15 to 16 says. It says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up. To cause trouble and defile many. We've got to ask each other this morning. Are we peacemakers? Or peace hopers? Take a moment to reflect on what I'm asking you. Peacemaker versus peace hoper. And as you reflect on this. Reflect also. On your attitudes. Your conversation. Commitment and actions. And while you're picturing this, picture also yourself stepping forward. Now that you've reflected over this, take these results and step forward towards the Lord's Supper. And let's start now with 1 Corinthians 11 verse 19. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. How would you know upon whom God's approval rests? I'll give you a clue. It's all about obediently following Jesus. The other end of the discussion is the love of power, popularity, disrespect, questionable doctrines, in other words, teachings, and people chasing after, pursuing their passions, such as a love of money, lust, vanity, and so forth. Now examine yourself again. This time in light of 1 Corinthians 11 verse 28. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. You know, if we want to sit at the Lord's table, we need to do it to His honor and glory. That means a clean conscience before God. It means asking for forgiveness. 
It means repenting. It means that we have to make every effort, now that he's reconciled us to him, to stay in that reconciliation, but also to find peace with your neighbor. The third area is peace with self. Have you ever thought about it that we are a society of discontentment? Many adverts, for example, aim to make you discontent, unhappy, dissatisfied with what you have in your life. But if you buy their product, things will change. In other words, if you buy their product, you will experience joy and happiness. It's a great marketing angle. It really is. And might be true. doesn't matter right now. The question is, what if peace and contentment relate to what you already have? Because as long as the world influences your contentment, contentment, your peace will relate to things as opposed to belief in God, identity, values, and ethics. World-influenced peace and contentment are temporary, easy to influence, and dependent on vanity and searching. But godly peace and contentment are lasting. They're grateful. They're meaningful. They're purposeful. World-driven peace and contentment are driven by what you don't have. Godly peace and contentment are driven by who you have. In other words, God. World-driven peace and contentment say, if, then. It's conditional. The problem here is that peace and contentment rely on an external locus of control, meaning from the outside, inward. The Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit and finds peace and contentment from within. So what is occupying your thoughts and your mind and causing discontentment? Paul says we are to focus on the things which are noble, right, just, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent and praiseworthy. The battle for peace is going to be lost or won in our minds. And if you want to experience peace, focus on Jesus over and above yourself. So let me bring it all together. There are some principles we can follow here. The first one is, are you a born-again Christian? Romans 10, verse 9 to 10 reads, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Secondly, We've got to focus on what binds us as believers together. If we are to agree with the Lord, we must focus on that which unites us together, and that is our faith in Jesus Christ and the grace we've all received in him. We are also reminded of our common mission together. Paul reminded the church at Philippi of all the work they'd done together in the past and that they'd faithfully served their Lord and their church and they brought other people to faith and they ministered to those in need and they were building the kingdom of God. They had to work side by side for the same purpose. Next thing to remember is that we are all children of God and nothing we can say, nothing we can do is going to change that. We are all recipients of grace and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. In the fourth place, seek and receive help of others. Paul asked the other believers in the church to intervene and to help resolve conflict. But that also means that you and I must be willing to accept the help of others. Peaceful doesn't mean easy. I mean, Jesus didn't come and promise easy. He promised help. In fact, he told us to expect trials and tribulations. But he also said that if we called on him, he would give us the peace of God, which passes our understanding. No matter what hardships we are faced with, we can ask for a peace that comes from the powerful love of God that is not dependent on our own strength or the situation around us. So brothers and sisters, reflect over this message. You you will probably have the notes as well. Be like the little bird. No matter what's happening around you, there's craziness in that. Sing God's praises. Till we meet again. God bless. Bye-bye.